Good morning, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your day in Alato yesterday. I managed to uh, get myself a head cold. So probably everybody else will get one tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, those of you that went on the cultural visit uh, would have seen three sing sings. And um, so this this particular presentation uh, focuses quite strongly on that. There's a land of, a, of 800 complex cultures. In Papua New Guinea, there are three things that exist that are paramount. The first is Nogo. This is the Huli language, Nogo. They're pigs. They're the most important things in Papua New Guinea. The second most important is Tindi, which is land. And the third, and this is in order, sorry ladies, <laughs> is Wali, or women. And um, they're the causes of all the trouble. <laughs> they're the, they're the, they're not the women, these three things, all three, <laughs> are the causes of all of the trouble in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, and, um, but also all of the joy and all of the celebration and everything else. So generally when you see a Sing Sing celebration, there's a purpose behind it. They're not just getting dressed up in their feathers and everything for, for the likes of us. They're doing it for a real reason. One of the, um, uh, when we first went into, into Bulgaria, we went off to the coastal village, as Boring pointed out earlier, and um, this particular Sing Sing that we went to see is the, the Western equivalent, I suppose, would be a, a harvest festival. And it's the, it's the beginning of the new season and everything else. And um, as he mentioned, this, uh, this particular headdress, there's the guy's feet down there, he's inside, <coughs> mask, feathers, it's about 20 feet tall. And you can see on here, we've got, these are all dog's teeth, shells, numerous feathers, beautiful masks. Now these masks you'll see, well hopefully you'll see them for sale in Madang, and Wewak probably, and then more shells. So they use use everything of nature in, in, uh, in their uh, displays. We've got a couple more, diff to two totally different masks, but here we've got um, uh, wallaby tails, and these are seeds. And you can see the size is the face of one guy and that's the mask and it goes up for another. Now, in this particular village, when they got going, the main dancer, as I said, women are very important in Papua New Guinea. They, uh, to start off the festival, he was outside of the village and these two ladies <coughs> prostrated themselves on the pathway into the village and, and he leapt over the ladies to get into the village. So this is all part and parcel of the, of the ceremony. But the, whilst that was going on, in the men's house, all those masks and feathers and everything were kept in the men's house. Women weren't allowed to go in, and, and well, village women weren't allowed to go into those houses. Morag went in and had a look, sort of the other white women that were there, so there wasn't a problem. But also in the men's house, so these two guys blowing bamboo flutes. So there's, that's a pretty decent sized lump of bamboo there. And this uh, old man here with his. And all they did was blow into it, move the fingers around, and there's this plaintive noise coming out. And that went on all day. I'm really surprised that these guys didn't hyperventilate while so doing it, but it went on and on and on forever. But other coastal um, uh, sing Sings, you can see the, the decoration here. I've highlighted this person's mask here just to give you an idea that these are all dog's teeth and these are what they call pisias or fish siasi. Uh, they're like a, a tiny cowrie shell and what they do is they'll cut a branch off a very large tree and anchor it onto the, the seabed and these tiny little cowrie shells all congregate on the ground on these branches and they think it's like a reef, an artificial reef that suddenly sprung up. And then they'll go out and they'll leave it there for maybe three or four months. And then they'll just lift it out of the water very quickly 
and they catch all these tiny, tiny little shell, shellfish. Now these dog's teeth have been traded. As you can see, there's on, in the coast, they're very, very little use for keener shells. But like in any economy, if you've got a lot of stuff that you don't really need or use, and somebody else needs or uses it, and they've got stuff that you want, you trade it. And this is what's happened in this area. They obviously didn't have hundreds and hundreds of gumless dogs running around the place. <laughs> and um, this, this is just one, like, one uh, particular thing. thing. And uh, in this, this is all in Borgia, and this is something uh, quite, well, unique to me anyway, is that these are all ladies dancing, very unusual for ladies to get uh, as involved and dressed up as they are here. But again, this headpiece, which is this headpiece here, all dog's teeth. And then this on the back, you can see there, that would be a metre and a bit long. And it's all woven, interwoven with dog's teeth. So they, they trade the dog's teeth from other villages and they'll send shells and the like up into the highlands there. And one other aspect that was very culturally was very interesting was the, um, the design of the grass skirt. And um, in this particular instance, you can see the levels, the layers, and they're all very symmetrical. That is just the design of the skirt. This particular skirt is not. And this indicates the number of children the woman's had. So she's had four kids, this particular lady here. So they, they, they're all indicative so that when, when people are dancing, they've got an idea of who's who in the zoo as far as, as, far as their uh, uh, traditional dress is concerned. I'll just show you this, uh, this again, this is one of my uh, Super 8 videos digitized, so bear with it. It is uh, 43 years old when it starts. Oh, there we go. <coughs> now, as you look around, you'll find that these dancers, this is inside or these dancers got a different type of headdress to other groups that you'll see. This, this was um, uh, not self-government day, it was the year before, and it was just a big cultural get-together. But as you can see, the, the style of, these, these are duk duk dancers from uh, Rabao, which we're not going to get to see, unfortunately. Um, but, but I don't believe we are. But they're the high school teachers, or the teachers from the high school, the tall eyes, and they dressed up in their, their traditional garb. But you can see in this particular instance, there's another long pole here that is prominent in that headdress. The headdress is similar, but these are obviously different again, but in this whole clip there were seven different uh, Sing Sing groups which were from seven different villages, all different cultures, all different languages. So, excuse me, when I spoke with you uh, the other day I, I talked about the young boy that was uh, um, arrested for murder and tried and, and found not guilty and the reason for um, doing it was they didn't want him to be seen as a, um, a Sanguma man. And one of the patrols I went on, I had to actually go out and arrest the Sanguma man and bring him back and, and try him. And just to give you a brief uh, explanation of how it all works, uh, this particular guy gets, um, he's like an, an assassin, he gets uh, hired by somebody to to kill somebody else, so they think it's going to be done by magic. But and the um, the Sanguma man have a, a little bull. People know what a bull roarer looks like. You piece of piece of wood on a bit of string and you <laughs> wang it around and it makes a noise. Well, he had a bull roarer type thing, and on one end, piece of string and a little hook made out of a turtle shell. On the other end, he would fasten something that belonged to the potential victim and um, together with a piece of gallop nut. A gallop, in, a gallop nuts are, are very popular in the, the Medang area. And um, the, the level 
of ab ability to summon up the spirit of the person that's going to have the magic put on them depends a lot on the closeness of the of the person to their to their body. So the worst thing that you could have is a bit of excreta. A fingernail was pretty good, but generally when fingernails were cut, they were put in the fire and you wouldn't get them. Hair was very, very uh, popular, but again, if that was cut, it was thrown into the fire, so the Sanguma man couldn't get it to make magic. So this particular instance, this guy had gotten hold of something close to the potential victim, put it on the end of his bull roarer, and summoned up the man's spirit, put the bull roarer on the table, and the piece of string went underneath with the little hook. So he was able to fiddle with this hook to make this thing move, which supposedly was the spirit coming to the bull roarer. And the gallop nut, and I think it was hair he used on this instance, was on the one end. And he had a piece of rosin that he collected from a, a tree that had been struck by lightning, which was obviously very, very different to anything anybody else had seen. And this was his magic stone. And when this thing vibrated, he whacked the gallop nut, and that was it. The spell was cast. The man was dead as far as the person that uh, paid for the treatment was concerned. And um, he would then sneak around until he found the victim, and he'd knock him on the head and uh, render him unconscious in some other way. But then he would get sago palm spikes. Now, sago palm spike can be about this long, like a big thorn, huge thorn. And what he would do is he would rub that in excreta, and he would push two, one in either side of the neck, down inside here. Then he would get the most horrendous stinging nettles you could think of and rub this body of this guy, unconscious guy with these stinging nettles, making sure that these two holes up here were covered with blisters. The man would eventually wake up, find that he's covered with stinging nettles, and about four or five day, days later he died from septicemia. I was in Madame once and I saw an x-ray of a guy who had been murdered by a Sanguma man and he had a piece of copper wire that long, right, the pushbone right through his chest. Um, and uh, obviously we, we arrested this guy and he was charged with murder and uh, sentenced. Now, taking Sanguma and black magic to the next step, we end up with Papa Yali. If anybody knows anything about cargo cults in Papua New Guinea, this guy who I think he died about four or five months after I took this photograph, he was the head of the single biggest cargo cult ever in Papua New Guinea. And we as Australians have got a lot to, to be blamed for, for the creation of the cargo cult. Because Yali was a, a sergeant of police, and he was taken from Madang down to Brisbane during the, the war, and he was being encouraged by army intelligence, um, to work for the Allies against the Japanese. And they took him in to, to Brisbane and they showed him various things, the, the cannon factories, lots of trucks going on and off vessels and the whole pile of it. said, if you help us beat the Japanese, all of this could, could be yours. He immediately assumed that it would be his if he got his people together to help fight the Japanese. One of the other things they did whilst he was in, in uh, uh, Brisbane also was to take him to a couple of brothels. And he had an experience, or his first experience, with a condom. And this set his mind going as far as the very, very pragmatic people, Papua New Guineans. How can I use this to become a really powerful person in my area? So he had a think and then he when they shipped him back by submarine back to, to Madang, he took a whole pile of condoms with him. And, <coughs> excuse me, he set up these uh, little huts with his flower Marys, his flower girls in these huts. And he'd call in all of the leaders from all of the villages, right along, right from, from Bogia, right down past Saigon. We're talking about 300 kilometer coastline. He'd call them all in 
to, to encourage them to help the Allies against the Japanese. And as a reward for them coming along, he said, please, make use of my flower Marys. However, you've got to put this on. And they were totally ignorant, so they got a, a, a condom they put on, and they'd gone to the hut. And at the end of the, these visits from all these traditional leaders, Yali had a row of glass jars and bottles, each with a condom in it, each with a name written on it. And as I explained before, the power for the Sanguma man was based on how close the item to be used was to the individual. And as far as a man is concerned, you couldn't get anything more powerful than a condom full of that individual sperm. So he then had all of those leaders by the short and curly. So there was no way that they wouldn't do what he asked them to do. <coughs> slowly, slowly, with, with education, that dwindled and of course a lot of the elders died. Um, Yali's son became the governor of Madang province and he tried to resurrect Yali's cargo cult and he's now doing time, fortunately for everybody I think. But that will give you an idea of how things get turned around and utilised in, in PNG to, for the benefit. When um, we, I, up in Tep Tep, um, this was a, a Sing Sing that was organised for um, self-government day. And as you can see, the, the, um, these headdresses are, are similar to the ones on the coast, um, but a lot bigger. In this particular area, that again, there's another seven villages came together for this, this celebration. In this particular area, um, the missions had gone in and uh, uh, did their thing. And one of the things that they did was to convince them to dig very, very large holes and put all their traditional gear into a hole and cover it all up. So their culture was being decimated very, very quickly. The government decided that they were going to have uh, Sing Sing Friday, and which meant that everybody had to celebrate their culture. So all of these cultures were resurrected again. This particular dance, uh, Sing Sing, I've, I've never seen Kundu. They, these Kundus are huge. You should, would have seen them at the market yesterday. But these guys are stamping here and standing next to them. The ground actually shook. And the, and the tone from those Kundus actually made, you, made your body shake as well. But this is in, in I say, in Tep Tep. That's the patrol officer's house up there. I'm oh, sorry, up there. But um, when I was on this six-week patrol, the Japanese War Grave Commission came through and they were collecting uh, remains of Japanese soldiers and they, um, uh, they visited and stayed with me in that house, patrol officer's house in, in Tep Tep. This, uh, Tapa cloth here, you'll see in a f future presentation, it was gifted to me by the dancers after the sing sing. If I can get this thing to pause, there we go. Oops, <laughs> it didn't work. Never mind. I was hoping to show you a particular sing sing, which um, outfit, which was only done at night time. The first first thing thing that I, I saw at night time and they had like a big umbrella of, of, uh, of uh, cockatoo feathers and a huge pole that would have been 25 foot tall and they wore a, a, um, a harness that this pole was on and they would walk around and flip this pole it was just an amazing sight but the Japanese War Graves Commission um, uh, came up and they, they, their main job was to, to find <laughs> Um, remains of, of deceased Japanese soldiers and um, they would send a word out to the villagers, the villagers would go off they could the find a skeleton they would bring it in if they found a helmet or a sword or whatever they would bring it in and the Japanese would, <coughs> would pay them for this and they'd have their list of names 
and then they'd go through and if they could assign the skeleton uh, or, or anything that they found to a deceased soldier, they would tick them off as being recovered. And uh, when we were in Tep Tep, they, they brought in a little badge, a little musician's badge. And in this particular regiment that, that retreated through Tep Tep, there was only one person in the regiment that had this little musician's badge. And the guy that was sharing the, the house with me, it was his mate. And he, he just totally broke down when he saw this little musician's badge. And um, to pay deference to the spirit of, of his mate, he sat up for oh, five hours playing a Japanese flute. If anybody's heard a Japanese flute being played, you really want to be in a place like Korea or China or some other place because it just went on and on and on. But to give you an idea of what happened, this is in the, in the, uh, um, the Sidor coast, flying from Sidor down the coast, you come to a place called the Yupna Valley. You turn right, follow the valley along, and you end up in Tep Tep. Just before you get there, before you turn right, you see this piece of, this is the terrain that you're walking through, or if one, in this particular case, flying over. This ravine here is called Seven Step. There's um, a village here, and one obviously on the other side. And to get that, that, that village, to get from that village to the one on the other side, I'll play the video again so you can see it, hopefully. Um, to get from one village to the other, it's called Seven Step because they had seven bush material ladders that went down one side of the ravine and seven that went up the other side. When the Japanese were retreating through here, they were emaciated, the, the stories of cannibalism and, and the whole works. And um, the villagers from the, the village on, the first village we saw, um, a lot of the Japanese were going down these seven step ladders, we're talking about hundreds of feet here, and, and they'd fall off because they were um, emaciated and starving. Those that made it across the bodies at the bottom and then up the other side, the villagers waited at the top of the ladder with a long pole, and as soon as a, a chest appeared, they just pushed them off and they went down. There was well over 350 skeletons at the bottom of, um, of that ravine. The, on the coast, they, they were uh, lay, contract labourers. These guys are, are highlanders and they'd be there working on uh, coconut plantations and the like. So whenever there was the opportunity for a, a get together and a sing sing, they would turn up they didn't actually dance round and round or whatever, they marched. Now, this is just a very small group, but if you can imagine three, four, five hundred of these guys all marching towards you, you'd soon get out of the way. And here's a very short clip of the uh, first anniversary celebrations in, in Tari, and you can see the way they just march through. That's all they do with this particular group of people. With their sing sing. But in the, this, this isn't Tari, Tari town, but uh, in Tari it's the land of the Huli and uh, those people that haven't been to Papua New Guinea will recognize the, the yellow face of the, of the Huli, it's, it's synonymous with, with Papua New Guinea. I'm going to go a little bit in depth into their wigs and structure a little later on, but just to point out this here is a the sugar glider carcass, long tail here, um, but they, uh, this, this particular group was in 2007 when Mooring and I went back for the Can We Help program and these are the guys that came out to greet us in Tari. But just to give you an idea of this, their Sing Sing, this is a, a sort of in between Sing Sing where you've got a lot of a lot of youngsters here being trained, taught, they're not uninitiated men, but they're being given an education in the Sing Sing. And um, they, um, 
uh, the, obviously there's the leader. The, what, they, what they've got in, um, with the Hoolies is they've, they've got a system where the, the ones that wear the black wigs, I suppose you would call them the Freemasons of the, of the, of the Hooli. They're, they're a society with secrets uh, within that community. You've got red wigs and they're, they're the ordinary people. So let's give you an idea of the of the dancing that they do. Again, they don't go round and round or whatever. They just up and down. But when those drums are going, you can, the kundus are going, you can, you can get a sense of the rhythm. There, there may be a group of these dancers in Madang. There may be. And you can see the shiny skin. That's that's from a um, a sap of a of a, uh, of a of a particular tree in the Basavi area. That they trade up and up and down to for uh, the offcuts of the keener shells that the Huli have got. This particular um, costume is even even people that currently live in, in Tari in that area haven't seen this. So I saw them photographs of this and they've, they've never seen it before. So you can see how the cultures are. Some cultures are disappearing, but it, it is in the Huli area. There's the local government councillor there with his little bands on his on his wig there. But this um, Sing Sing group are from an area, um, the place is nearest to is a place called Mount Kari. Mount Kari is going to turn into Papua New Guinea's next huge uh, gold mine next to Porgra. Porgra is in the Enga province, Mount Kari is in the Hela province, well half of it's in the, in the Hela province and the other half is in, in the Enga province, but those people are going to be very, very uh, wealthy from the gold there, unless they kill each other first. But this will give you an idea. They have a like a buffalo horn uh, wig, and these young fellows. We were here. This is more uh, spoke about opening a, a uh, netball court. So this was the the same thing that went on for for opening the netball court. I'm sure they can bounce the ball. Real oh, netball. You don't bounce the ball in netball, do you? You don't need to. But this is the um, this is a typical sing sing. Now they don't normally wear blue. <laughs> the blue obviously come from the trade store. They wanted to get to uh, get dressed up. But um, this particular sing sing, um, people have, uh, uh, that have seen um, Torres Strait Islanders and uh, the dress and the, the flag, the Torres Strait Island flag, has got the the feather. Um, uh, headdress on it. Well, these people are from the Daru area, and they're all, again, another lot of teachers and, and eight post orderlies and the like from Daru. And you can see the similarity in the, the headdresses here from, from uh, Thursday Island, Torres Strait Islands, similar music. So there's that crossover between the different sections, and these, these ladies are, are from the Chimbu, very famous for their black cockatoo wicks over uh, headdresses. In um, in the Basavi, way down in the Basavi, this is the, the type of sing sing that they have in the Basavi. And um, again, this is like 250 miles inland from Daru, but you can still see a similarity in the, the headdress that they're wearing. From the back of these guys is a very thick uh, woven um, uh, piece of, of uh, material and attached to the end of it of huge freshwater crayfish claws. And when they're dancing, these, these things rattle. But generally, they actually dance inside the house, not outside the house. So it's, um, they, they put this on for me um, on one of my last patrols through, through the Basavi. Um, on uh, Independence Day, we had a, a, a groups come through, and again you will see this the crossover between these two guys with the wigs are doing a similar dance to the other log, but they're the Hoolies and he's from the Basavi. So you can see that that meld between the various sing sings in, in the different places. So they end up. This guy was portraying a, a spirit. And frighten the living daylights out of the kids. 
as, as part of the celebrations. And um, he was the, the butt of a lot of jokes. And again, the, this is the, the dancing that the ladies would normally get involved in. Um, I can just imagine bumping into him in the dark. <laughs> but um, when, when I was on patrol, um, this is a, a Ragiana uh, bird of paradise. Just to, I'll, I'll let you have a good look at this because you're going to see some of these in a minute if you've got good eyesight. <laughs> but when I was on patrol doing some road work, here we are cleaning up the road, making sure that it was uh, at least looked good. Um, I was in a in the hut at the end of the, the road and, and um, I just happened to have my camera with me. And I woke up in the morning and perched in a tree directly behind the hut was a raggy out of bird of paradise. I rushed in and I, I grabbed the camera and um, very, very quickly grabbed a shot of this bird in the tree. That's it flying over the top of, of the hut. But I followed it to where it had gone. I could hear the calls. And here we've got one here. You can see the red tail there. And you'll see a flash of red and a yellow head up here in a second from a different bird. This is me probably 60, 70 meters away from the tree with my Super 8 camera on full zoom and um, no tripod. So you can get an idea. Here's one coming in here. See the yellow head and the red tail. This one's still, he just jumped up into here. Well, not yet, it's still there, but there's one there, another one there. And a couple moving around in here. And they're all making their mating call and displaying in these open branches to allow the ladies to see them and um, say, okay, well, that one looks pretty good to me. I think I'll go home with him tonight and, um, and carry on with the process. Now, to give you an idea of Huli, Huli wig and the, the makeup of the wig, I pointed out to you before that in there was the possum, the sugar glider um, tail and, and uh, body. But to give you an idea, this this is a, a ribbon wing, this bird of paradise. This is this one here. Um, just uh, the, this is a lesser bird of paradise, in through here, and then at the on the front are the superb bird of paradise. Now, if you've seen David Attenborough um, show with this this little fella here dancing around, this is a like a bow tie and this is a ruffle at the back of the neck. And they, that bird dances very, very much like these guys when they're doing their dancing. So it's all, all related. The, um, uh, also in this week, you can barely see it, but there's a King of Saxony bird of paradise feather going through there. You can see the little stripes. And then this one's a sickle bill, um, big black sickle bill tail. But also there's cockatoo feathers in here. Um, the um, other aspects that you can see in this the same thing and on the back here is a hornbill, pig's teeth, and this is the cassowary bone knife, which uh, under law we had to convince all of them to blunt the end so it couldn't be used as an offensive weapon. But when they actually make the knife, they they don't make it. They don't uh, carve the shaft as much as they used to. And then here, they would roll up the paper money and push it inside and keep that keep the money and paper money in there. But these are all lorikeet feathers. You can see around the edge here. And again, there's some possum possum skin there. So they make use of a lot of of nature. Here we have a range of, this is when we went up uh, to, to see them with the Can We Help program, but you can see a range of wigs. All these guys are from different places, of this guy here and here from the same place. But they've all got a different style of wig. And there's the Keener shell that we spoke of before. Now they, um, 
I, I'll go back to Papua New Guinea has been very pragmatic. One of the things that we had to do was to in, increase the or improve the general health of the, the population. And one of, the th of those things was to encourage them to stop their, their normal uh, burial practices and actually uh, bury their dead as we would, cutting down disease and, and infection and all the other bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, this is how they would, would have uh, had a, a, the dead, the body would be inside a coffin on stilts and the body would decompose. There's obviously a little roof on there to stop any birds going inside, but the body would decompose inside that coffin. They would then take that coffin once the body was totally decomposed and they would turn it on its end and then they'd sharpen up the top of the coffin and that would allow the spirit of the deceased to come and go at will. They, they, the hoolie's got a totally different uh, approach to um, the afterlife than, than a great number of, of other tribes in Papua New Guinea. We had to convince them not to do this and to bury their dead. So as I said, being very pragmatic, they did exactly what we said, but they dug a hole that was twice as wide as needed, not nearly as deep as we wanted them to, and they would take that coffin and put it in the hole. They would then cover it with these planks of wood, and the body would decompose. Once, and there's the, the, the little roof, the same roof, the body would decompose in there, and once it was decomposed, they would take it out of the hole, there's the body, there's the coffin in there, They'll take it out of the hole, stand it on end, and say sharpen these points here, decorate it up. There's a, a femur here. And that then allowed the spirit to come and go at will. <laughs> and they would have they would have a, various families would, would get together and they would have the um, obviously the skulls of the of the people who brought out. This particular skull, uh, this person was killed. Uh, with a, a blow of an axe on the bridge of his nose and consequently all of that was smashed but they, they um, when you went, went past you know who was who uh, in the, uh, in the uh, cemetery there. But this is where they've progressed to. This is the mausoleum I suppose of uh, Samati Abbey Yui who only died uh, very late last year and you can note the design is very much like the Huli Wig. He, uh, Samadhi Abiyui, was a member of the Constitutional Planning Committee and uh, a really great guy. He's only this tall, but uh, he was a, a, a really powerful man in the Huli area. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for bearing up with me in my cold. Um, there will be another presentation between Matang and Raval. I hope you learned something from this, but I would like not to have had the cold and I would have been a little bit more